Whether we're talking about population density, land usage, or the width of streets, the character of the urban environment can have a profound effect on the way in which society within it develops. In today's conversation, Rahim Takazadgan and I talked to Martinus Grobler, the Chief Design Officer at Tipolis. We discussed the differences between top-down and bottom-up approaches to planning, how these approaches affect social structures, and why free private cities might help us to foster a greater sense of community. I'd like to start off with a question for Martinus. So, you're an architect and the Chief Design Officer at Tipolis, which is a firm that works with governments to create special economic zones. Can you start off by telling us a bit about your background and how it is that you became involved in architecture and how it is that you came to have this specialism in economic zones themselves? Hi, Peter. Um, thanks for having me on. Good seeing you and good seeing you again, Ryan. Yeah, so I was always perplexed by the idea of um, states organizing society. It was always the weirdest thing for me. And I always, growing up, thought it's because these people are so clever and um, they are just amazing and that that makes sense of course as soon as you start your work you see that it's quite the opposite that the incentives for them being there and the, it's all sort of a more of a power game also at university i was sort of underwhelmed by the by the explanations of how how you know why this needs to be and on university as architecture is a soft science it was um you know even the university lecturers and what they would teach you there didn't really make sense. Luckily, we had some great lecturers going um, out of their way to teach us complexity theory and complex systems, which was um, an anomaly actually in our uni in universities in South Africa, I would say, um, at that time. Um, but specifically focused on biology, you know, and on this cellular level of how there's bottom up order and how how life, in essence, puts entropy into order. Um, you know, and also focus on, say, mathematical attractors and Julia sets and all of those interesting things of how, with really simple rules, there can be, um, you know, key, <laughs> there's a, a lot of emergent order, which is, is quite interesting. And I think that's still today's essential lens to understand nature and economics and everything and society and human nature. Of course, now it's um, getting a bit worse. At universities where, ugh, I know of universities where, you know, the students are greet, greeted in the morning as, you know, good day, my young socialist friends, and, and, and. <laughs> I also had some experience with this with my further studies. For example, one of our assignments would be how to help find the ways the state could expropriate property, you know. So it's, um, it's, quite, it's quite shocking what people are being taught. So it's, I think, quite important to choose the right institution. So I terminated those studies sort of in protest. And then my further work frustrations and sort of interaction with the bureaucratic class, you know, also led me to, to think that there's got to be a better way, you know, and I realized that these people are sort of educated beyond their intelligence. It doesn't make any logical sense. It's, a, it's all based on mythology and sort of a cargo cult idea of what, um, you know, what city should be. Then I discovered the Austrian school through the writings of a local economist, um, Darby Ruet, and he uh, wrote one of his books. And in that, he ref referenced to Austrian economists. And I discovered Ron Paul and Ludwig von Mises and Rothbard and all of those people. And you know, read for years. I read late into the night and <laughs> studied their works. And you know, what's great about that is that they're not—they really the only ones being capable of dealing with complex systems, you know, the way they, they understand it and shed light to, on it. You know, they're not trying to change human nature, you know, like the modernists or the socialists, you know, through the, the praxeology, uh, praxeology they, they, they offer, which is based on human action, you know, that, is, that quickly made sense as to correct, as to correct foundation for epistemology. And it's just amazing the miracle of markets and the emergence of price and um, of that emergent order that it's going based on. And how it's just based on a few simple rules, um, which remains voluntary, by the way, which is great. You don't even need any coercion. So that's all, you know, made, made a lot of sense to me. And that's, yeah, that's sort of my, my journey. So you were studying at university and that was quite a, say, a left-wing environment. And then you went on to do quite a lot of personal study. You also had some interactions you mentioned with the bureaucratic class 
people that were involved presumably in city planning uh, on a on a sort of decision making level and those experiences changed your opinion about the correct framework for viewing urban centers so can you tell us a little bit more about what those interactions were so did you have some specific difficulties applying for permissions to to build or design buildings and get them implemented yeah of course there's some of them um i saw it sort of on a on a low level with my work so just some stuff that didn't make sense immediately was the assault on property rights for example how you know my clients would think they own a property but then in essence they realize they really don't they're actually just renting it from the state you know the state can impose any sorts of extra taxes there's a lot of uncertainty the for example they require setback lines so it doesn't you know that makes it you can't fu fully utilize your property it ends up um, or they have parking requirements you know for whatever they the idea of um of um, parking should be at at, at that stage of or how to control transport so that led me you know to a lot of frustrations and also to see that yeah like i said you don't you don't really own property rights and on a on a larger scale with to see how how everything is manipulated there's no true cost of the of living together that no no price to to any actions that could are able to emerge because this is so so controlled by the bureaucratic class um there's um for example the way cars are subsidized you know so any other transport mechanism can't really compete with that there's also the the whole idea that just zoning in general that um that we've spoken about before to just you say is people need to work here and and play there and you know it's sort of based on on nothing really there's no there's no logic behind behind the decisions really so it was very shocking to me actually to realize that the whole country or the whole society is being run by people with no clue whatsoever and that those frustrations of them led me to sort of further investigations into looking looking for answers yes thank you so Raheem, you're someone that studied the austrian school of economics very deeply what do you think is going through the, the heads of people when they implement all of these very prescriptive planning permissions and the zoning that Martinius is referring to. Is it that they just haven't grasped the basic principles of Austrian economics? Or is there something, is there a legitimate reason for wanting to have these very prescriptive policies regarding urban planning? Yes, there are two legitimate reasons. Uh, they are not uh, good reasons, but it's quite difficult to understand why they are not good reasons. The first reason is uh, scientism. Uh, that's really the success story of the natural sciences and engineering. And uh, of course, the status it confers to the experts uh, in those sciences. And uh, I myself, by training in natural sciences as well as engineer, and I've always felt that uh, it grants a lot of legitimacy because most people don't dare to challenge you in those fields because they're that formalistic on the one hand, on the one hand or the other hand, it's obvious, it seems so complicated and so complex uh, questions they are, they are treating when in fact they are only treating the simplest uh, questions that can be treated. Uh, so uh, in fact, uh, physics can be as formalistic and difficult to grasp because it's only dealing with the most simple <laughs> problems uh, there are. And there was a very fairly recent development in the natural sciences to understand the field of com complexity uh, science and, and complex systems and uh, the Austrian school was a bit prophetic there in understanding that uh, most social phenomena are of this order and that's a distinct order of the things that uh, we can uh, plan or that one human mind can plan uh, that we really need a division of uh, knowledge and uh, division of labor and uh, division of action to cope uh, with that. So there's one reason I think it's in a sense legitimate that uh, we have granted legitimacy to experts and we still trust uh, a lot of those experts and this expertise. Uh, we just haven't found out which fields uh, uh, to apply to and, and how those disciplines are really interlinked uh, and, and uh, what are the main differences between the social sciences and the natural sciences and engineering. Um, and on the other hand, uh, it's a reaction. Uh, it's a reaction against the dynamics of technological development. And there really something has changed in modernity 
uh, is whereas in the past we were very limited with the tools and patterns that we could use and that gives a kind of uh, an ensemble quality to uh, all human constructions. Uh, they are more the crafts, arts and crafts based styles uh, uh, of, of tools that we have learned to cope with that uh, usually are passed on in traditions uh, uh, and so on. Uh, versus a dynamic of technological and industrial development, uh, which has surpassed our understanding and uh, by now has become in a way self-sustained, uh, I would say. So part of that zoning is a counter reaction, trying to protect uh, in a way what was there and, and coping with those changes. Uh, I, Again, I think it's it's not a good solution. Uh, it's, it's trying to cope with the symptoms and a lot of this coping with symptoms exacerbates the problem, uh, uh, which is paradoxical uh, in a way. So I think there are good reasons and uh, not, uh, 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 but uh, the main reason that you for good reasons achieve wrong ends is that the incentives are just not right. It's uh, uh, that for those people who are in power and in charge and are decision making, it doesn't really matter too much if in the long run the results uh, are in accordance uh, with their predictions and what you expect uh, from their expertise. Uh, their power increases uh, not with the success, but more or less with the failure of the interventions because we have spirals of interventions. So you try to act the symptoms that are there are the legitimacy for interventions which create further symptoms of maladjustment, which are further legitimacy mm -hmm. uh, for more interventions and so on. And that's a vicious circle, I think. And it's in particular in the field, everything that's political. Uh, I think we can distinguish from market processes which are not perfect, but where there's at least a kind of market discipline where customers can say, Say yes or no uh, and of course they can say so for different wrong reasons and they can make errors and so on but at least there's a discipline of having a say uh, and refusing a result or a tool or an offer or a process whereas in the political field uh, we've come to accept that we don't really have a general say other than uh, a vote every uh, five years maybe or really the exit of going elsewhere which for most people is just too much uh, leaving away the, uh, the social climate they are accustomed to and the family and, and, and so on. So would it be correct to say that people see the success, the practical success of engineering and the natural sciences, and then they assume that that same kind of mechanistic thinking can be applied to economics, despite the fact that economics is a science of human action it's the science of individual value judgment which by its nature is is subjective yeah but i but i think it's more about legitimacy it's uh, with the i mean religion has become much less important and in a way science and academia has filled that va vacuum of uh, somehow determining who you should trust and if you say trust in science nowadays it really has some religious underpinning. I mean, we need the basis in society and trust is crucial uh, for society. Uh, I just uh, think that uh, for epistemological reasons, it's, it's really difficult to have science fulfill the function of religion uh, as it does uh, today. Uh, and it leads uh, really to a politicization of, of science uh, and the misapplications of the methods of the natural sciences to field of, of cooperation of living together and, and the whole class of social phenomena, which are much more complex uh, than any single mind can really fathom. Okay, so I'd like to turn the question back to Martinus. The people that argue for quite prescriptive planning regulations and zoning would tend to say that those, those prescriptions actually serve a very important social function. If I have a city district and I let anyone create any sort of business alongside residential neighborhoods. For example, someone might want to create a car factory right next to a load of residential apartments. There would be lots of spillover effects from the car factory. There would be noise pollution, air pollution, and this would necessarily impact on the quality of life of the people living in the residential area. So don't you think that arguments like that represent um, a legitimate case for having prescriptions on what can and can't be built in different parts of the city? Um, yes, that's a, a great question. So um, if you look at these different um, cities in history that, that dealt with that differently, I think 
most cities today deal with the same with zoning and trying to um, centralize the control of pollution, you know, that the state would be sort of the custodian of what is good pollution and bad pollution. But that is, um, that's not working well, really. Um, I think an exception would be Tokyo, which to some extent sort of um, their zoning is more on pollution, really, or on your activities. If, if you cause noise, you, you'll be sort of worked out, but, but not 100%. They sort of have a bit, bit of that. Um, so if we look at how cities worked in the past, it was, it was all done by property rights. So, you know, everything is rooted in property rights and you, there's a law that sort of developed around it to enforce that. So if I had a polluting activity, um, next to my neighbor, he would add a quick recourse against me to either stop that or, um, pay him damages or they were, you know, through tort law, for example. And they would have been, I would have had to um, pay the cost or, you know, of my activities. So say I was making furniture and there was some sawdust, sawdust that landed on the, um, on someone's washing line or there's noise or I'm polluting a river, then my, my, the product or my services would be so much dearer. And eventually that sort of externalities would be internalized into my product. Um, where and eventually i'll just buy my own you know be be sort of zoned out of it or the law system would would um make me go or, or <laughs> work me out to somewhere else so now there's a complete different idea of that the state can do this but centrally and sort of design societies and activities which is <laughs> really <laughs> preposterous because it's so you know the complexity you deal with is immense so no not even an artificial intelligence um, would be able to to work with that which by the way might be the next step for the bureaucratic class to say look we've got this artificial intelligence models so that's why you should trust us even more but that that faces other problems of subjective value problems of um, how do you price in something that someone wants to send their send their kids maybe to a a better school rather than upgrade his garage or, you know, build a, a new story. So, um, to his house, or, um, there's also the calculation, the Hay Hayekian calculation problem that can't be, can't be solved by that because, you know, it's ever changing. So in the, in the old days, um, traditional cities was, was interaction of property rights in the law system over hundreds of years. It's incrementally process that adapted and changed and this process gave us the true cost of streets of pollution um, and the typologies emerge around that so in a sense it's more a, a pattern of organization of self-renewal that um, was enabled by that bottom up process and you know unlike now where bad bad ideas and practices aren't aren't allowed to die they just they just keep keep on keep with us and they're just being subsidized all the time we also see this in you know if you look further in in the history of how how modernism you know wanted to change human nature and you know like creating the the working man you know that modernism <laughs> wanted to create um which nascent necessarily mean means a top-down change of human nature people aren't going to do it voluntary so immediately you lose the voluntary situation and quickly you see that the end apparently justifies the means um, which is quite dangerous and we still we still in that we still see this today where the end justify the means especially if you if you're looking from top down and you're working with um, macroeconomics <laughs> Of you know, you try to change behavior, and if people only know what's good for them, they'll follow it, but they don't. So now we have to force them, and and and. But you're so far detached from the their context and their their world that um, that it's problematic. You know, one size fits all is obviously obviously problematic. You also see how that leads to you know picking winners and losers. Um, like we said, you know, which pollution activities are allowed and which not. So they would say, for example, in the old days, the sparks of the, the trains would set some farmer's fields alight. And eventually the train lobbyists said, okay, well, it's ridiculous that we're being um, held accountable for this. Obviously, transport of trains is more important than producing a few crops. 
And but they've lost time and again because it was rooted in property rights and the law was on the side of the of the farmers. And that made that they had to the, the cost of transport had to be priced correctly for for society that you know the pollution of it so the, they had to take measures to you know to curb that. But then those lobby groups became strong enough to change the, the will of the state to say okay, so the state can pick the winners and losers of saying yes we think transport is more important than farming and but <laughs> once again it's impossible if you work with such a um, complex interwoven situation that's you know to say that inevitably like Ryan said this leads to more intervention and spirals of intervention and where we are now in a situation where property rights aren't looked after at all and yeah that is quite problematic so I can see the problems that you mentioned regarding a top-down plan for for zoning because the government has to assume that there's some sort of objective measure that they can use for determining what the correct level of pollution is at any given time which is something that will depend on people's individual value judgments but i'd like to ask Rahim a question about this common law system that martinus refers to isn't one of the problems with a common law system that you're still subject to uh, the problem of trying to objectively quantify people's individual judgments about damages being done. So for example, if I have that car factory next to my residence and we have a common law system, the car factory is operating late at night, it wakes me up for several nights on end, how can I possibly put a price or how can a court of law put a price on the amount that I should be compensated for losing five hours sleep? I would, I would probably argue that it's a higher figure. The car factory would argue it's a lower figure. How could an independent panel possibly come up with an objective figure for those subjective value judgments? There's nothing objective uh, really there. Uh, we can only hope for intersubjective understanding. And usually in such dense locations as cities, uh, that's based on shared values. Uh, so there's some basis must be there uh, what uh, ends conflicts because otherwise every form of litigation can again be used as a form to perpetuate conflicts and to uh, perpetuate the win-lose uh, mentality. So generally there must be the willingness to have this kind of dense win-win interaction, which is the basis of a city. Uh, and I think the politicization uh, that we've seen uh, even under the premise of, of democracy has uh, let us to oversee that there's really a need for kind of consensual basis mustn't be uh, not necessarily uh, explicit uh, but more in an implicit maybe even unconscious sense uh, of being willing to risk that living together with foreigners with, with, with whom you share physical neighborhoods uh, and with whom you share kind of infrastructure uh, and uh, so I, I think there always has to be a kind of alignment unless, I mean, you could have this metropolis kind of development where technology uh, serves as a bridge uh, when we lack trust for interaction. I mean, there are technological uh, solutions, of course, to that, uh, not solutions in the sense that they are final terminal, but tools to cope with problems of lack of trust and those are sub surveillance technologies, uh, uh, but also technologies that just reduce the amount necessary for trust uh, in interaction. Uh, but the problem is always the in-between, uh, the compromise where we have technological development, but our social tools and infrastructures are not developing in such a fast pace and, uh, and not having to come up with this kind of, of innovation that uh, we take for granted now more or less in the technological realm. So that's why I think the general framework is really important here to look at. And uh, of, of course, uh, part of the pattern of uh, past urban developments was the generally society was uh, not as dynamic as it's nowadays, that there was more homogeneity uh, in the populations and so on. So we can really go back there in, in, in uh, turning uh, the clock back. But uh, uh, the general process was much more uh, 
uh, made much more sense uh, in the sense that it was incremental, as Martino said, it was more emergent, uh, more emergent order because we didn't have the tools uh, and not this kind of legitimacy for experts, know-it-alls uh, who could prescribe or in a technologically possible way could prescribe the way to build because it just wasn't feasible to, to have a, a master plan uh, and then uh, have the uh, uh, computerized, uh, digitized tools uh, where you can make just plans reality like that. You always depended on people being able to craft that, being able to translate it into patterns. Uh, um, and uh, I think we can learn uh, from that uh, situation. It's more or less the default situation. And we got to, to uh, uh, open that space for a more trial and er error kind of process uh, in, in city formation and settlement formation as well. But how on a practical level would you compensate people in a court of law for things that there isn't a, a kind of intersubjective agreement about the value of? Would it be monetary compensation? Uh, yes, uh, if we live amongst foreigners, uh, which we are used to, then usually money as the medium of exchange is the best solution because it's not associated or it's the most neutral one, not associated with, with explicit values. But of course, you need the implicit values of being willing to live with foreigners and being willing to look for win-win cooperation with foreigners. So I expect in that uh, urban uh, settlements where we mostly interact with foreigners that will have differentiated rights, use rights and so on. And we have monetary compensation, not only as compensation, but uh, as an even more abstracted way in that you pay for rights and you have auctioning, the auctioning system of a market there uh, where you can express a willingness to pay uh, for certain, I mean, even long-term usage of of rights and we can have all this differentiated structure that nowadays we I think we take for granted in many ways but haven't really adapted it uh, to these problems of zoning and externalities as well. Uh, but uh, I think there's also a longing of people for this more value alignment uh, and there I think we'll see something similar to zoning but much more aligned with the values of people. I think we'll see more settlements of homogeneous people where there's an agreement in values and even aesthetic styles and then uh, you'll have prescriptions uh, but those are not one size fits all prescriptions but I think scale dependent prescriptions or where you have more liberty on what patterns you use within your household and, and, and uh, the home of your family and then you have a quarter, uh, a neighborhood and then you have the cityscape or settlement scape on the whole and people will uh, ascribe different values to the uh, rules there that you have. So some won't care too much about the large scale rules and others will take a liking and come up with patterns which they propose to other people. And I think there we'll see alignment even in, in uh, things that may look like much more prescriptive than our city developments today, which are on the one hand top down imposition of zoning, on, on the one hand, on the other side, an atomistic structure of just people uh, fending for themselves and being uh, building just as they are able to build and as they are able to afford. Whereas I think uh, if there's more innovation in the space, we'll see more people living in neighborhoods and settlements which give a, a possibility to express joint aesthetic preferences and joint uh, externality preferences, if you like. So there'll be uh, louder party uh, town-like settlements and quiet uh, family-friendly settlements where you don't really have to question of, because then you'd say, and I think that that was the core of your question, for some kind of settlements and some people they'd say where well, there's no money compensation <laughs> that can compensate me for not being able to sleep through the night because that's really important to me uh, and so on. There's nothing that can compensate me for a risk imposed on my children. So I really don't want a car driving through the street in front of my house and I care a lot and it's not a question that I'm willing to negotiate on. And I think that's fine. I think that's fine because that's why I said zoning tries to answer. There are good reasons for that. It's just the tool is very blunt and it's not well applied. Uh, and uh, uh, I think one way to solve that is really have, if you go for the way of settling with people where you want to have more alignment in the values that you have a list of patterns for use. 
uh, which you propose. And I think it'll be usually a solution that's not as prescriptive as we are used to it nowadays. So you'll have a list of common patterns. You can use them and it's, you don't need any process, no bureaucratic process. If you use the pattern out of the book, then you're free to build it if it conforms. And if not, it's a process of how you can match what you want to build with the preferences for the neighborhood and the people you live next door to each other. And I don't think that must need to be bureaucratic processes. And I don't think you have to write on objective ways to solve every kind of conflict. Uh, uh, it's more finding sensible agreements, how you expand the range of patterns, how you can adopt patterns. Uh, uh, but I think for that kind of settlements, it'll be much easier because the uh, just, uh, shared basis of value is made much more prominent and visible and transparent uh, uh, and uh, uh, th th that's much better than having an imposition uh, top down. So when you say patterns, do you mean like intellectual property rights to a particular blueprint for building something? Is that what you mean? No, 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 no uh, not property rights. I mean, really uh, like uh, patterns that how you could build uh, for your facade, for example, what it should look like, what styles uh, uh, people would like to see in their neighborhood. So I think you'll have it for a neighborhood or a quarter or even settlement style, you'll have a collection of different building styles and proportions uh, and color patterns and so on uh, okay. from which you will choose because you want to blend in if you're looking for that kind of settlement. And I think more and more people are looking for that as well. Uh, I, I, I think it's a bad idea to try to get that kind of result through the uh, normal politics as we know it because then we only end up with compromise and the one size fits all solutions. I think those more aligned communities will be smaller communities and I think on the other hand, there'll be something more dynamic and futuristic uh, for people who like that and prefer that. And they know the kind of uh, urban living together that we're used to is a trade-off where you want to have as many interaction partners as possible, uh, but you don't know them. You don't necessarily have to trust them because you make use of technology. Uh, maybe in the future, you'll even won't even see them. Uh, you just uh, link to those people in a digital way. And uh, there's nothing uh, bad about it, just bad that we'll have a compromise uh, uh, like that imposed by the way we tend to think about politics and frameworks. Uh, so I think the cities of the future, if this field becomes more innovative, will be more futuristic than what we've seen and resemble more past cities uh, that we've come to like uh, uh, because they are expressions of organically and incrementally, incrementally uh, uh, grown patterns uh, of people building and, and trying to form their surroundings according to uh, the needs of their lives and, and their families and the neighborhoods and so on. So Raheem's mentioned there the way in which futuristic cities might move to more traditional urban development models. So Martins, this is a topic that I understand you're also interested in, the way in which the way that the cities are planned has changed over time. And you kind of make this distinction between modern and traditional urban plans. Can you just tell us about how urban plans have changed and, and what you see as being the definition of those two descriptions of cities? Um, yes, yeah, you made some, some great points there. Um, um, so if you look at the traditional, it was really a bottom-up process, again, with simple base rules rooted in property rights and the in incremental interactions over time that created patterns. So patterns emerged out of that. Um, a similar analogy would be um, in nature, if you look at um, even a single cell organism like some, a slime mold, for example. Um, it can, just those the basic rules of maybe pulsing a signal to the neighbor or um, over time that can sort of create a type of intelligence. It can, um, you know, it can build up memory um, and those patterns are quite interesting. And it's also adapted to local context, so it's much more efficient. Even, even we ourselves, we are, in essence, we are only patterns of organizations. You know, if you look at, um, if you look at 
the matter that flows through you. I think about every 12 years, you're basically new matter. There's some B parts in the brain that takes a longer time to, um, for atoms to, to change. And so what are you really? You, you're a pattern of organization, apart from soul and <laughs> all, of, all of that, which is, which is quite interesting. The, the immense complexity and emergence and even emergence of consciousness that can, um, that can happen through these little base, base rules. For example, also the, um, the way your DNA works, it's not really a blueprint. That's a bit misleading the word. Um, it actually dictates in each instance what would happen if, I, if this molecule comes into contact with this one or this protein in contact with this one. And I might have my terminology wrong there, but if the, and you would emerge time and again, you know, you, you would emerge or the pattern of you would emerge, not exactly, you know, yourself. Um, which is fascinating, really. And the same, the same goes, so that's why we see independently in the world, in different places, um, the typology of urbanism and traditional cities was quite the same, um, because this pattern would, based in property rights and human nature, which is more or less the same everywhere, would, would spit out these certain patterns. And then came along, uh, after the war, um, the pressure of, of the socialists um, was sort of um, given free reign with modernism, where they, they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to design this society now. We know better. We're going to change human nature, and, but we're going to do it on reason. It's going to be based on reason. And we think reasonably, this is reasonable, this and this. And they build a logic model to, to do that, which was flawed from, from the start. And as modernism ended, the postmodernists said, well, we know socialism has been sort of proved wrong in principle and in, in through trial, um, but we're not going to admit defeat. So we're going to rebuild society based on feelings rather. So that was the um, in the assault on language that you that we saw through for Colt and Derrida and all of those those people and uh, Marcosis and um, which is still sort of going um, amok. And yeah. So that's the that's the two main main differences, and some of them aren't really reconcilable with, with each other. So a lot of people have a problem. So say say the problem of cars in the city. So everyone knows they're being subsidized. It's wrong. We need to get them out so that we can get the true price. But it's not so easy because we in this system where everything is subsidized. No, there's no emergence of price. Um, there's no price discovery. So we have to change a lot of things in unison, which is impossible. You have to change six things maybe for us to go back to the traditional, well, not, not to be going back, but to have a, a, a sound process spit out a great pattern. You need to have safety. You need to have a law system that's efficient. Um, you need to have no zoning. You need to have direct costs where nothing is subsidized which means a different tax system, which means a dis different uh, power system structure altogether, which um, the chances of that, just all of those things happening together is quite scarce. So that's why the, um, the idea of rather building alternatives is, is a, uh, I think, a much more pragmatic solution. Um, and then eventually building a network between these alternatives and have competition between them, between these towns. Um, then you can have almost like the Hanseatic League was in the in the old days, where you know, which was a huge trading network, um, which eventually became so powerful that they built their own cities and and, and also commanded their own armies. Um, yeah, which is which is quite interesting. So that's also the our our approach on on urban design would be now so say we have the the opportunity to build now a new city or a new town that's a quite an interesting problem because our our project would mainly be on on new sites which is uninhabited so the idea would be to you know how do you create a living organism out of nothing it's like how do you build a rhino <clears throat> so our process was to think okay say this this ecology of freedoms did exist we had property rights, we had safety, we had zero tax, we had no subsidies, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And this was going on for the last hundred years. What would have happened in this area? 
And, you know, that's quite difficult. And we, we don't have the hubris to say, you know, it would have been exactly this. So we, we try to, to see what this process would have spat out. And that, that, isn't, that would be a pattern rather than something else. Like, it's almost like tree seeds, you know, you can scatter them and each tree would grow, grow differently, but they still have the same pattern. And this one that's a bit closer to the river might look a, di a bit different than one that's on the hill or fell on other soil. And so one way of, of guessing what this pattern would be is to model it, um, to say we, we take all the variables and we sort of put it in a computer model to fast track evolution and you know see what what's spitting out but it's so complex and and there's so many things coming together and you're working with the human condition and society so i think it'll be um yeah i don't think we're ready to attempt that yet there's some great tools that you can have for example modeling traffic flow and you know some even cost benefit analysis and you know what sort of prices might emerge but the whole idea of emergency is that you you don't know so it's even even that as a tool is um is still is still limited and so our approach was rather to look at the trial and error that already happened through, through old cities that had a similar ecology of freedoms in, than we would have in a free private city project. And we learned a lot, lot from those and we realized you know, that the typology, the urban environment would look, look much like them, but it also will be much better because we have the opportunity of new new technology that we can use as well, new building materials, we have more connectivity, and it was also another point it was also interesting to see what what made these old cities flourish and those were ones where where um, division of labor was possible to happen and for division of labor to happen you had to have maximum connectivity of complementary uses so but it's problematic because you don't know beforehand so the central planner can never do it because you don't know what's going to be complementary you know, quickly innovated society. So they, it's not just density, it should be density of complementary <laughs> um, functions, which is impossible to, impossible to know beforehand. So this is great for us to look at the old cities and how those became um, great hubs of innovation. Because you have, have this um, amalgamation of what happens between minds, you know, the innovation that, that is fostered from that and the competition and driving down prices which which is great but in cities today you can't really have that everything is subsidized there's no price discovery to figure out what the true cost of a car is for example it's almost impossible because it's subsidized in some instances and it's taxed in other instances you know it's subsidized in the land land use that is proportioned to it in most countries you have parking requirements even on your own property that that doesn't belong to you that belongs to the the cars transport solution and everyone even i would have said in the 60s you would have said cars are so amazing you know surely we we need to pick it as the winner it'll be stupid not to but it just goes to show the danger of um of not allowing discovery and emergence and they have completely decimated cities and, and communities and and uh, um forming of sound neighborhoods and sort of super organisms and even even something like water the true price of water um where i live in cape town there was a drought uh, two years ago and you know but it's interesting the the province didn't run out of beer or hamburgers but they they ran out of out of water but damage those subsidies can do is sure you um provide water for almost free so say my water cost would be 400 rand a month but my indirect water cost would be about 4,000 that is taken from my taxes. Um, so now they, during the drought, there was a lot of companies that wanted to you know, start project of desalinization or uh, getting water or building dams, but they couldn't compete against the 400 Rand I had to pay. You know, even, if they can, even if they can deliver it for 2,000 Rand you know, worth, of, worth of water, because they have to compete against the subsidized ones. So that means that there's no competition. So that's, um, that utility would stay, stay quite expensive and scarce you know, for, for, for society. The, the one argument would be that you know, subsidies help, help uh, poor people that can't afford it. And which is, but it's also doing them a, a disservice because no competition makes that 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 price would never be able to, to be driven down through, through competition. 
So it's very hard to unravel, obviously. Um, you know, a better idea would be to rather give them a sum of money rather than, you know, so that everyone pays the 4,000 rand it really costs for, for water and allow competition. Um, but, you know, just don't break, break the price mechanism, you know, it would be better. Well, what, what I was going to just say as a, as a follow up is, is, so you're kind of painting this picture of the fact that innovation occurs in cities when there is a high density of complementary uses that, that you see and that historically you saw those emerge naturally from the bottom up. And now you're seeing more prescriptive policies, which are making that, that kind of organism, those patterns that you're referring to uh, harder to emerge naturally. Uh, so my, my, my question to follow up on that was how do you think the principles of free private cities would help to solve that problem? What would a free private cities, type urban agglomeration be able to do that you think would would address that need for those complementary uses of urban space? Yeah, so we have a luckily a completely different um, ecology of freedoms, which would help obviously there's, um, so a lot of bad ideas would be allowed to die. You, you know, if it, it is churn of bad ideas is possible. Um, you can also, you know, quickly buy, uh, there's a lot of adaptability as well. You can, you know, with just a transaction between you and your neighbor, you can buy half of his plot or half of his business or, you know, even complex things like a part of his view in, in exchange for, you know, using a parking for once a month or whatever. And the idea of having the density of that churn makes that the complementary um, um, functions can quickly arise and adapt. It's also, we're also looking for, for density which is possible because we don't have setback lines, we don't have um, wide, unnecessarily wide streets, um, you know, zoning that's, you know, people have to work here and live somewhere else in, in town. Um, so that means that you, you have the opportunity of, um, of these um, high, high density, high connected places um, where, where that can happen. There's also, it's also more conducive to sort of the super organisms of family and, you know, families might live in a compound, not the idea that, um, you know, if someone's above a certain age, they need to be sort of locked up, um, you know, in another part of town, in an old age home. Um, and those, those family structures and community structures are quite important. It's quite, um, it's a type of insurance. It helps for skills transfer where older people, they have also have complementary skills where older people can f fulfill some roles and um, within a family, family compound structure. There's also internships that's possible and it's all financial insurance within that and in the, the large community, the larger community as well. And yeah, so it's interesting how you can belong to many super organisms, like you can belong to a family, you can belong to a church, a uh, tennis club, or some of them can even be abstract, like an online community, and how, how these have a life of their own, and how, um, how they, you know, all interact with each other to, once again, um, <laughs> um, compete, compete for prices to emerge. So there's, there's also the idea in a free private city that everything is private, but that doesn't mean it's just individuals owning a lot of a lot of things. We think that the first thing someone would do with individual freedom is go and voluntarily commit himself to obligations in groups and in these super organisms, just in order to survive. And the efficiencies are so great. So you know, as a as any organism looking for the most um, return with the with the least energy spent, you know, that'll that's the obvious thing to do is to commit yourself to 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 these super organisms. And um, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's quite interesting how it can, can belong to a lot of them. And also, if you commit yourself voluntary to a super organism like a tennis club, you know, the, the chances are that that process would lead to, to a healthier organism rather than sort of being coerced and one that needs to be artificially kept alive, like a lot of <laughs> sort of the mythologies of a nation state and some socialist states, um, which, which we know sort of needs to extract a lot to, to keep themselves going. 
So Raheem, does that tally with your understanding of what you would expect uh, free private cities to be able to achieve? You mentioned that you would expect there to be more homogenous communities where people had more closely aligned values. Uh, what's your view on these kind of superstructures, the, uh, the term that Martinus is using there, um, of, of family and of uh, community that, that emerged? Do you think that they would be much, they would be much stronger uh, if the market was allowed to determine what the configuration of, of the urban environment was. Yes, there's another insight from complexity theory, interestingly, that you have uh, scale dependent different rules. Uh, so it's uh, the, uh, uh, the opposite of one size fits all is you have different scales and the different scales, different rules and different processes. Uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense and it leads to more resilience and anti-fragility. Uh, of settlements is one of the reasons that they tend to survive for a long time uh, if they are not artificially constructed but organically in, uh, evolved. Uh, uh, and uh, why would free private cities provide a space for that in a way? Because it's a greenfield development, not only in the physical space but in the legal space as well. So we can try to do without the distortions that are already there and uh, then leave space for an organic development, but uh, have uh, intrinsically built in more empathy for customers who are not only then uh, people looking for industrial parks as we have in special economic zones, but long-term residents. So uh, there is a discipline by uh, the needs, the long-term needs of residents who have to voluntarily agree and, and risk. Uh, I mean, it's a big step to settle uh, in, in, in something as new uh, and the kind of frontier, I would say, uh, nowadays. So along this empathy and then... Uh, uh, that you'll have a company where the owners are responsible. So if they suck or fail, they are really punished by losing their investment, uh, uh, which still, I mean, could mean that they fail, uh, but then it's part of this churning process that uh, Martinos uh, mentioned. Uh, and I think many projects, of course, uh, will fail, but uh, uh, the framework uh, allows for the innovation and the skin in the game, interest and incentives uh, I think uh, we'll work as a discipline to avoid unnecessary failure because it wouldn't make sense from an entrepreneurial perspective to just copy what's already there. So you try to improve and you try to improve uh, based on the empathy for your customers, long-term residents, and based on where you see uh, are the most, uh, the easiest way to improve. Uh, and and uh, those will be the most obvious uh, faults of our uh, uh, distorted uh, system of urban development, uh, which we have nowadays. Uh, so I think it really needs that kind of a cre legal greenfield. That's I think, uh, I mean, you can have lots of settlements and they don't really depend on the legal sphere uh, and they happen, but uh, uh, I think they really ha have to uh, be sustainable. You need to have a new autonomy of this development uh, where it can find new rules that's uh, not only aesthetic rules uh, because they may be fine for the people settling there for the moment uh, but you want to have the process in space that guarantees or at least makes possible the long-term survival of the settlement so even if the people change and their children take over they still find it's a lively and functional development it's uh, uh, not kind of, kind of museum for their parents uh, which is Aesthetic, uh, and uh, uh, I think that can only be solved if we are free to innovate uh, with the frameworks because the city is not only its buildings, uh, the building is just what you see. Uh, the, the city is a network of people living together and finding win win possibilities to live together. Uh, and, and where you can be a full human being, not just someone uh, going for a job and not just someone uh, caring for kids, but all the facets of our existence. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a very complex problem to align those interests, the change over time in our lifetime. Uh, and I think there's a, a, the more humble approach is to learn from those kind of organisms of the past, which doesn't mean that you don't innovate. It's crucial to innovate, but some of the innovations may be just going back to proven 
patterns that uh, have emerged out of the needs of people. And then uh, we'll maybe see that we are not that different from our grandparents uh, uh, or in not every aspect of our life that different uh, from our ancestors. Uh, uh, so we'll have to find a better match between the con continuity of our existence and the potential uh, um, ways to develop the tools that we can use nowadays uh, uh, and there are crucial questions to answer i mean one of the questions is what does it mean for cities when uh, ways to interact become more and more digital take place more in the virtual reality uh, for example may that free up some parts of infrastructure that now are adopted to have a density a very high density the million people kind of density uh, i think it's possible that we'll realize that we it's not necessarily necessary anymore to have this kind of millions and 10 millions density physically, uh, but uh, shift some of those connections to the digital realm and thus have more livable, walkable uh, surroundings in the physical realm, uh, not the suburban style, I think still denser than uh, suburban areas, uh, but somewhere in between. So I, I think we'll discover, I'm not sure, but I think we'll discover op more optimal sizes of a few thousand people living together uh, in, in surrounding that are, that are adaptive, that have kind of shared pattern language maybe, but still be dynamic and, and uh, uh, allow for every kind of scale and order of human interaction from the very small scale, which means uh, yourself, your family, uh, having the safe surroundings you wanna have to, to uh, raise a family, uh, raise children, uh, to the neighborhood where you have more day-to-day -day interactions and then the higher scales of, of, of the global division of labor. Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's a lot to learn and, and a lot really important questions. Uh, we, we need to start trying to answer them. Um, so we've covered quite a lot in this discussion. Raheem's been giving us this overview of how incentives are at the core of what makes a city function and we discussed that there are different ways in which free private cities might adopt policies and different communities might come together and have their own patterns of different kinds that would determine their peculiarities. But what free private cities would seek to do is create a constructive competition between these different urban entities so that the patterns that emerge for different groups would, would be allowed to emerge without these economic distortions that are created from top-down planning uh, occurring. We've also covered, uh, as part of this conversation, some of the super organisms that were, that were referred to by Martinus in terms of family and community and how those emerge out of the urban environment. And we talked about the importance of uh, legal structures and how cities that didn't have a zoning policy would be able to deal with certain legal issues related to the violation of people's property rights. Um, so we've covered quite a lot in this conversation. For people that want to stay uh, up to date with you, Martinus, and uh, would like to find out more about your work, what would be the best way that they can do that? Thanks, Peter, and thanks for, for the talk. One, one thing I just need to mention is that obviously the, the thing enabling all of this is um, centralized money. So that led to this big problem we have, and I um, I wouldn't regurgitate all of it again, but um, Ryan and Kelly Lannan had a great talk last week where they discussed especially the effect of the Cantillon effect, how the people that first spend this new created money in urban centers have also huge distortions at hand, and that obviously keeps this whole subsidized and Ponzi scheme going. So that is of crucial importance that I neglected to mention, but there's a great talk um, of it last week. Another thing that Rhyme also spoke about is the idea of polycentric cities, how, you know, you wouldn't get this, meg, you know, mega cities, for example, if you look in nature, you know, sometimes an anthill, you know, it stops and it duplicates, or it's um, a, a mongoose wouldn't just grow until it's 20 meters tall, you know, sometimes it matures and duplicates. And you can also have that competition within, within a city itself. You know, there can be different zones within it with different rules. Maybe the initial one would be more formalized and the other ones would be more experimental, which, which is great. And as to, um, they can just get my details on um, tipulus.com. There's um, our team's details are there. So my 
email address and contact details would, would be on that. Great. Thank you very much for the insights you shared today, Martinus, and thank you very much, Raheem. If you'd like to find out more about Free Private Cities, our website is www.freeprivatecities.com. And we also have a Twitter account where we post regular information about Free Private Cities, news that has come out related to the concept and uh, snippets from interviews that we've conducted either ourselves or with partners. So thank you very much for listening and we hope that you join us for more conversations in the future. So thank you finally to Martinus and Raheem.